I, I now have the pleasure of introducing our third Tangaza speaker, Dr. Johan Furi. Uh, Dr. Furi is a South African professor of economics at Stellenbosch University in Cape Town. And he's the author of the book, Our Long Walk to Economic Freedom, Lessons from 100,000 Years of Human History. Um, Dr. Furi is also a columnist and blogger contributing various articles on his website, which we will share with all of you in the chat. Um, and his work is also featured in a number of prominent newspapers. Um, as an economic historian, Dr. Furi, we are very grateful to have you come and speak to us today in response to the question, um, how have nationalism and modernity shaped Africa's post-colonial socioeconomic experience? Um, and with that, I warmly welcome you to Tangaza, and I thank you so much once again for joining us today. Uh, good evening, actually, from uh, Stellenbosch. Uh, thank you, Bengi, for this kind introduction and for organizing this. Um, I am very impressed by the fact that so many of you joined on a Saturday evening when there are a million other things that you could have done. So I hope we will have a good discussion. Uh, the plan is to talk to you for about 30 to 40 minutes um, uh, about the kind of mostly post-colonial African economic history and then with a specific focus on South Africa, of which I know a little bit more, I guess, um, uh, than the rest of the continent, um, and, and then to kind of share ideas. Um, and, and so obviously the purpose here is to share what is, uh, what I've kind of extracted from the literature. So these are not all kind of my ideas. They are based on the kind of latest research in the field of African economic history. Uh, but it's also important to note that this field is expanding and now uh, is, you know, as we dive into the archives uh, and we perhaps have new points of view uh, in a different time, we reflect uh, in different ways on the past. So it's important also to keep to keep that in mind that this is not a set uh, um, kind of view and uh, an unchangeable view, it can certainly adapt as, as we move into the future. So let me, I think, begin by saying that, uh, as Bengi kindly uh, remarked, this is based, uh, this talk will be based on my uh, book that appeared last year, which was published in South Africa, and it's available on Kindle. Uh, but there will be a uh, um, Cambridge University Press edition that appears uh, in July. Um, so I'm quite happy that, you know, there will be an international version of the book. But if you want a prelude and you've got a Kindle, then you then you certainly welcome to to acquire it that way. So uh, it's a book that consists of 30, 35 chapters. Um, and um, today I'm going to refer to chapter one briefly and then chapter 25 and especially chapter 32. And then I'll end uh, with chapter 33 as well. Um, OK, so perhaps just uh, I, I suspect that uh, most of this course has not really been about economics. So I think it's useful to just, um, and this is also kind of comes from the reading that, that was assigned, to just briefly kind of go through what is it that economic historians do, what has happened to the field in the recent past, um, and what are the ways that uh, economic historians have tried to explain the history, the economic history of Africa. So it's important, I think, to note first that, of course, there's a massive renaissance in African economic history. So to just put that into numbers, when I was attending the first African Economic History Network meeting about uh, 12 years ago, um, there were about, uh, I think about 13 to 14 people in the room. And that was basically it. Um, and, you know, the previous time that we could meet as a conference, there were more than 100 papers that were presented. And to just give you a sense of the dramatic growth is there's this Wheeler Institute um, course in African economic history that is presented at the moment over the last couple of weeks and for the next couple as well. And, and I was fortunate to present on that. It's hosted by the London Business School. And there were 27,000 participants um, on that course. So, so suddenly a massive revival in African economic history. So that's fantastic news. I think for this audience, it's also important to keep in mind that a lot of this is um, based on work that I've done outside Africa. And so that's partly my mission here in Stellenbosch is to, is to really promote the study of African economic history from within the continent. I think there's a lot that we can offer, perhaps new perspectives, 
um, interpretations that are slightly different, uh, maybe a some slightly different emphasis as well. Um, uh, and so that's really what I kind of try and instill in, in, in my students, both in the economics department and in the history department. But it's of course important to also note that this kind of revival is not um, you know, based on, on kind of nothing. There's, we stand on the shoulders of giants. There's many that's come before us. That's also thought about you know, how African societies have um, solved the economic problem. Uh, in various ways that, you know, the kind of deal problem of production and distribution. And so I'll just kind of quickly go through these different schools, right? They, they again, not discrete schools, they, they kind of on a continuum and they kind of vary in shape and size. But the idea is basically that soon after independence, there was this modernization school. I'll say a little bit about what happened in Ghana uh, in terms of this school. But the idea here was simply that uh, African countries uh, have these traditional economies, mostly rural based agriculture, and so they need to transform, they need to industrialize, and so they need to adopt the blueprints of what the successful, um, in those kind of successful quotes, um, Western countries had done um, and, and transform and modernize, right? So this kind of links up with the theme of today's lecture is also, you know, modernity. The idea here was certainly that there must be this, almost this blueprint a template kind of switch from, from a traditional type economy with kind of a large rural population to a more modern uh, kind of um, industrial economy. Um, the dependency school came at a time when the optimism of this modernization school had kind of withered away. And the idea was that, you know, these African economies that have become independent should should modernize pretty quickly and it's, it failed to happen. Uh, and for that's for a variety of reasons, we can go into that. Um, the dependency school said, well, actually, uh, let's take a step back and see, you know, perhaps these blueprints are not appropriate for the continent. In fact, what these blueprints might be doing is just perpetuating uh, the unequal trade relations during the colonial era. And so the dependency school actually proposed that Africa should not uh, adopt these blueprints from the rest of the world, from, from the West per se, but actually they should sever these ties with the West and do their own thing. Now, actually the kind of interesting thing for those of you who've read the, the Hopkins piece is that he remarks that um, actually the interesting thing that both of these schools share is that they actually give little agency to Africans themselves. It seems that it's either the West that is good or the West that is bad, but it's always kind of looking outward. It's not really looking inward, which is kind of an interesting point to make. And so that's really where the Marxists came in and said, listen, we let's let's see if, you know, what is what has happened tradition or in kind of former pre-colonial times in African societies themselves. Um, of course, what the Marxists try to do is to put that within a very specific class structure, right? So looking at the kind of proletariat um, and, and seeing whether they can define certain groups and see that in the archives. And what they found actually was kind of discouraging is that African societies were far more kind of diverse and heterogeneous than what they had thought they would see. And so also there, the kind of ideas, the, the theory, basically, the Marxist theory that they had hoped to see in the kind of empirical results of, um, uh, of their research wasn't really, um, you know, couldn't really be found, wasn't really a, kind of couldn't be applied. Um, so there's a short kind of uh, period also of where more annals type uh, research had been done. I'm not going to go into too much detail about exactly what is the Marxist school and the annals school. The annals school is, is more think of that as kind of total history. So you want to tell the stories of people from below. You don't only want to look at the kind of elites. Um, and, and here you kind of give a little bit more um, uh, attention also to say quantitative history. But I must say that Anal School in, in African economic history was, was uh, pretty short lived. And partly the reason there is that it, it really tried to explain what had happened, but it wasn't really, it didn't grab the attention of the, especially kind of the activists that were trying to change things. So, so the Anal School is more kind of a descriptive approach. I would say actually, when we get to the quantitative school later in, in point six there, that that's almost a return to the type of a null school kind of um, analysis that, that had come before and, and perhaps more so in, in Europe. Um, but certainly there was, an, you know, there was an, in the 80s, especially an 
an attempt to really kind of rewrite and and uh, kind of write a revisionist type of history and and the null school didn't really fit with that kind of view certainly the postmodernist school did the unfortunate thing of the postmodernist school is that it really kind of shifted the focus away from economic history more towards kind of cultural history and identity and power became far more important so the material aspect of things far less so basically what it meant is that in the 1980s and 1990s african economic history had died down and it's really only in the 2000s mostly because of a revival in or a revived interest from economists that um, african economic history again started kind of emerging again or experienced the revival and there are kind of two schools here i've just kind of grouped them roughly as the kind of the descriptive school and the persistent school the one asks what had happened so more like the annals approach just descriptively tell us what had happened and the second one is the persistent school that's mostly by the economists and for those of you tuned into this wheeler institute it's mostly these kinds of scholars that the kind of question is there's this historical shock how has this persisted into the present right and it's important work, but it's of a very specific kind of work. And there's kind of great summaries about, uh, you know, this field. Um, and I think kind of my paper chapter actually with Nonsio Bukile is a kind of great summary of all of this research in, in African economic history. So for those of you interested in that, um, that, would, that would certainly be. So I think um, the point here is just to kind of say that there's, there's many different approaches to looking at um, Africa's economic past um, and what I think what I'll be showing you today is a kind of a you know brief interpretation, mostly from the kind of most recent school, right? So I'll I'll be focusing on what is the most recent evidence, um, and and uh, you know we can take it we can take it from there. Okay, perhaps just the final thing about African economic history and to say why is there this renaissance? Um, as an economist, I always have demand and supply reasons. So you know on the demand side, um, as we'll see now. African economies took off in the 2000s, and so suddenly there's an, you know, a demand for why is it that African uh, economies are doing so well, and is this a new trend or is this something that we've seen before? So there's certainly a demand, a, a kind of almost a request uh, in understanding uh, this kind of growth of African economies. On the supply side, uh, you can think of the, the kind of uh, accessibility uh, of data. Uh, to any researcher, you know, based anywhere, it's now so easy to just download World Bank statistics or other kinds of statistics and analyze it on your own kind of laptop with freely available software. Um, and so, you know, in the past, that was really difficult. Numbers were also quite tricky. Of course, numbers remain very tricky in that, that a lot of the historical statistics are questionable. Um, and Morten Jaffen's work has kind of uh, alluded to that. But it's certainly much easier to, to start doing this kind of analysis. Of course, it still remains quite expensive to do this. There's, there's, in many cases, there aren't kind of written records that we would hope to find. Many of these records are in African archives that are difficult to access. Um, numerical sources, of course, can be biased. It's often constructed by the colonial government. I would argue that actually um, one could use those uh, colonial archives and actually um, through innovative techniques, try and ex kind of extract the bias and show the kind of prejudice in the in the records, and then kind of get at what is actually happening in society. So that's a kind of a long debate for 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 another time. But the point is that these sources are expensive, and so it's it's not it makes sense to some extent why it is often European or American scholars that are doing this rather than African scholars because it's so expensive, and that's partly what we want to do. Uh, at LEAP is to, is to try and get more funding to, um, to transcribe and analyze these kinds of sources. Okay, so let's, let's uh, tell the story, uh, and it's going to be a very brief story of kind of post-colonial um, post um, African economic development. So, I mean, I think you know the history of, of independence much better than I do, so I'm not going to kind of go into the political history of it, but we know that kind of 1957, it's Ghana that gains independence, Kwame Nkrumah uh, is its uh, charismatic leader. Um, and he appoints, you know, someone uh, that, is, that is quite famous, actually, as an economist, Arthur Lewis, uh, who's got kind of Caribbean ancestry or, and, you know, is, is uh, ultimately is a Nobel Prize recipient. In economics, um, to to help to to help him, you know, to help advise Kwame Krumah on uh, economic policy, development policy. And so the idea is that, you know, Kwame's idea is, is that 
Ghana should industrialize. Ghana is predominantly an agricultural society at this stage. It's actually a very successful agricultural society in the sense that it's producing cash crops, uh, cocoa and, and various other kinds of cash crops. Um, it's had about 10 to 15 years of sustained uh, high level economic growth. So four to 5% growth in the 1940s and 50s. Um, so it's actually the, the country is doing very well. And then Kwame says, okay, well, now we need to take the next step, right? And so just imagine yourself in those shoes in the 1950s, you look at the world and the world that you see, basically there are two options. The one is America um, and the American style. So more kind of, you know, classical uh, capitalism where actually, if you look at America in the 1950s, it looks like, well, they've just had a period of, you know, 15 years of almost kind of um, poor economic growth, the great recession, and then, you know, luckily, fortunately for them, they managed to grow again after the kind of during and after the um, Second World War. So that's the kind of one model that you see, right? That's and the second one is Russia, right? And and actually, what you know of Russia at that stage is that Russia was a poor country, and then Russia became socialist and then communist. And actually, what you see is the construction of these massive cities, industrial cities, massive, you know, tractor producing power pl uh, uh, plants, uh, electricity um, plants. Um, so, so really kind of industrial, high level industrial activity. And so it seems actually quite an attractive model at that stage to, to follow the kind of Russian model where you can really see the state playing an important role. Um, so it makes sense for Kwame in, in, some, you know, in some sense to, to adopt, to more to favor that model, not to say that that, that model is adopted, but to certainly favor that kind of that, that kind of communist model. Of course, it's not, it doesn't go as far as communism. It's, it's called African socialism. It's, it's never really defined very well. In fact, there are kind of hours of speeches where Kwame Nkrumah talks about, uh, talks about the um, you know, African socialism, but there's all these kinds of ideas and it's never clearly defined. Arthur Lewis's idea is that different to many other countries that have become uh, industrialized, Africa is actually labor scarce. So that's, that's important to keep in mind. So in many of the other places, these places were labor abundant. So the idea there was that labor should be shifted towards the cities where industrialization can then take place. So industrial production can then take place at low kind of wages. And so that will fuel economic growth. Arthur Lewis recognizes that Ghana is actually not labor abundant. Ghana is labor scarce. And in fact, it's the rural areas that are doing kind of very well. And so he, he suggests that actually farms should become important centers of further growth and especially productivity growth. Because as you increase the productivity that will release some of those workers to move to the cities and then those workers will start kind of the industrial process. Kwame Nkrumah takes a little bit of a different view. So he says, no, we should industrialize immediately. We should actually tax the farms um, because that will um, release some surpluses, which we can then spend in promoting industrial activity, building factories and kind of all kinds of infrastructure. So actually, after a couple of months, I think it's like 15 or 18 months, uh, Arthur Lewis quits and says, you know, this, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot agree to, to these kinds of, of, of uh, plans. There have been, there were successes. So the Okusongu Dam is built actually just kind of finished the month before um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah is, um, uh, is uh, um, captured, I think, in a, in a coup. Um, and um, so they were kind of successes. But, but most of these industrial plans, the building of factories, the building um, of kind of large uh, infrastructure projects, uh, never kind of is completed, kind of fails actually quite miserably. And so you've taxed these the farms, which are actually your um, the, the kind of uh, part of the sector of the society that act, or sector of the economy that actually is quite successful. Um, there were um, agricultural marketing boards, for example, established that, that buy um, surplus products at a specific price and then sells them in the international market. And, and typically farmers would then sell at a, you know, if the international price for cocoa, for example, increases, farmers would get a higher profit. Uh, but when there are these marketing boards, usually it's the marketing boards that capture that extra surplus profit. And that then fuels uh, Kwame Nkrumah's um, industrialization activities. But actually, it, does, it disincentivizes farmers from 
from increasing their product productivity, expanding, and ultimately that kind of that model uh, falls apart. This is in some sense very similar to what happened in Latin America as well, right? So Latin America, um, you know, say a decade earlier or so, you also see this attempt at um, uh, kind of import substituting policies and instead of kind of trying to export to focus on exports. So instead of, for example, focusing on cacao exports, it's about trying to produce things, industrial products for the, for the domestic market. And the domestic market is just simply too small. Same happened in Latin America um, and the same happens, happens here. To continue fueling. So as these kind of agricultural sector is in decline, um, but these major infrastructure projects keep on going, often they are fueled then by, by cheap debt, right? So, so initially, African, most African countries actually see quite rapid growth. And you know, paying off debt is pretty easy if you grow quite rapidly, as long as the interest rate is below kind of the growth rate, then it's almost you know, free money, basically. Um, so many African countries incur a lot of debt, but then obviously the 1970s come, right? And then as a debt crisis, Many of these uh, uh, countries are insolvent, and they then approach the International Mon Mon uh, Monetary Fund for bailout. And that is when these kind of structural adjustment programs are proposed, right? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit uh, today as well. I'm going to skip ahead. We're going to return, come back to those structural adjustment programs uh, just now. But I'll skip ahead. So, so that's basically in the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s. Let's go ahead two decades. And in May 2000, we see this of, uh, on the cover of Time magazine, oh, sorry, um, The Economist magazine, um, which says, you know, Africa with this young man with this, uh, you know, uh, rocket launcher um, and the title, The Hopeless Continent, um, which is a pretty devastating, uh, you know, uh, cover for, a, for a, I think, for an international magazine. And in fact, uh, about a decade later, time would apologize for, for, this, for this cover. But it's not, uh, it's, it's not, you know, you can blame the economist for this, but um, it wasn't such a unique view at the time. Uh, many uh, had suggested that Africa was in a kind of a perpetual, you know, downward spiral. And so here's one of the famous papers of the time by Paul Collier um, and Gunning, um, which, you know, just, added the quote here, even widespread policy reforms might not be sufficient to induce a recovery in private investment since recent economic reforms are never fully credible. Um, I remember as a, being a student and reading all these papers that tried to explain what was known as the African dummy, which basically meant that for those of you who know kind of regression analysis, there was always kind of, you know, a continent fixed effect, and then you would find a massive negative coefficient on the African dummy. So trying to understand what is the unique about Africa that's that sees it having these low growth rates. Um, and I mean, those growth rates certainly were true, right? Between 1975 and 2000, Afri many African countries had actually not grown at all, had actually kind of stagnated or even in some cases had declined in per capita GDP, right? So that basically means that in real terms, you could buy less, a, a household could buy less in 2000 than in 1975, whereas the rest of the world, of course, had seen massive increases in income, right? So especially many Asian countries. Of course, there were exceptions in Africa. Botswana was a, a, you know, an amazing miracle um, to have, you know, basically by independence, 1960, I think 68, 67, 68, uh, some of you might correct me. Um, uh, Botswana was one of the poorest countries in the world. And by 2000, Botswana was one of the richest African countries. Um, I'm not going to say too much about, you know, other things that had obviously happened on the continent as well, uh, but certainly HIV AIDS was a big factor by the early 2000s and it, it was receiving quite a lot of attention. And then a decade later, you have this story, right? Um, you have Time Magazine, Africa Rising, The Economist, Africa Rising. Uh, later again, I couldn't find the higher quality version of this cover, um, but this you can clearly see aspiring Africa, right? So now, by the 2010s, the story had, had changed uh, dramatically from just a decade earlier. Um, and so what is the reason for this? Now, at the time, I mean, as, you know, certainly I think one obvious one is that commodity prices increased quite significantly in the 2000s. So many African countries are commodity producers. And so certainly they benefited from that. 
But it's not just that. I mean, there were periods also in the 1980s when commodity prices were quite high, and certainly that didn't benefit many African countries. So to say that it's just commodity prices seem to miss an important trick. And so a recent kind of set of papers have actually said, well, let's reevaluate the 1980s structural adjustment programs. So before that, right, by the 2000s, everyone that called themselves a development economist kind of agreed that the Washington consensus slash structural adjustment programs, um, you know, what, was, what were they? They were ideas about market reforms, low um, levels of government uh, spending, uh, low inflation rates, um, low debt levels. Um, those are the classic Washington consensus type ideas. Um, that were reflected in the structural adjustment program. So these structural adjustment programs by the IMF were basically sets of programs to get countries from a state of insolvency, right, where they cannot pay their debt, back to a sustainable on a sustainable footing. And so they they um, they cut uh, expenditure on various kinds. And this is why the structural adjustment programs in many parts of Africa are still seen not only as bad but as evil, right? That they are seen as policies that really cut, for example, education spending or health spending um, and various kinds of other spending, right? Infrastructure, these kinds of things. Um, so they're certainly seen, um, I, I would, I, you know, I think even today uh, as pretty evil programs. Um, and of course, they are also linked often with things that had happened in Africa at that time. So you've got, you know, our picture, certainly for those of of us who grew up in the late, late 1980s and, and 90s, our vision of Africa is shaped by things like the Ethiopian famine or the Rwandan genocide, right? And so again, even though there might not be a causal link between the structural adjustment programs and, and these events, they certainly feel like they correlate, right? Um, and so in 2006, for example, I'm just gonna give this Danny Roderick, who is obviously a famous development economist, um, said, you know, proponents and critics alike agree that the policies spawned by the Washington consensus have not produced the desired, sorry, there's a typo, desired results. It is fair to say that nobody really believes in the Washington consensus anymore. The debate now is not over whether the Washington consensus is dead or alive, but over what will replace it. Um, so clearly, you know, even though these, I should just kind of give you a timestamp, even though these structural adjustment programs were implemented in the 1980s, the term Washington consensus was only coined in 1997, but it kind of reflected this idea of kind of more what some might call neoliberal um, kind of uh, ideas about how, how kind of society should be structured, right? So how the, the size of government in, uh, an, in, a, in an economy. Now, the interesting thing is, is that that was done in the 2000s, right? That kind of analysis. And, and one of the big, actually also, uh, development economists that agreed with Danny Roderick was a guy called William Easterly. Uh, and some of you might, might have read some of his work. He's quite kind of um, skeptical of, for example, development aid um, with someone like Ndisa Moya. Um, and Bill Easterly actually in a recent paper says, well, you know, perhaps we were a bit too quick to judge the uh, impact of the structural adjustment pro uh, programs. So, you know, in the second bullet, you know, Easterly was himself quite critical of these new liberal reforms. Um, in, in one of his papers, for example, um, he says, like, very similar to, to, to Danny Roderick, he says that these reforms were, were terrible ideas. I, I actually kind of went back to that paper and, uh, and read it, and it was, it's kind of, he's quite, um, quite critical of, of the Washington consensus and, and the structural adjustment programs. But in a more recent paper, he says, well, perhaps we were too fast to judge. Perhaps these reforms in the 1980s and 1990s, especially when many of these reforms actually kicked in, had a delayed impact. Um, and so here, the reforms, it seems, had a profound but delayed impact. Fewer bad policies did cause economic growth, um, particularly in those regions that were most likely to have had bad policies in the 1980s and, and earlier. So he says, perhaps we were a little bit fast in um, expecting a return to economic growth after the bad policies of the 70s, right? These kind of the excessive spending, spending far beyond your means um, had been reversed. You know, we, we expected perhaps that it should be turned around in two or four or five years, but in fact, perhaps it took a decade. 
And the interesting thing is that his study has now been confirmed to some extent by others as well. So Greer and Greer, this paper is published already. And then Belinda Archibong's paper with a couple of others at the Brookings Institute. Um, uh, this is a working paper version. I think this paper should be coming out soon as published. Basically confirm what we, uh, what uh, Paul Easterly is saying um, as well. So here's his, here's just a kind of graph of, you know, the share of countries with bad policy. So he's kind of, you know, way of defining what is a bad policy. Basically think of it as like you are on a course for unsustainable spending. You're spending too much um, than, than what your kind of say tax, tax revenue allows you to or economic growth allows you to. And so you can clearly see actually, you know, this is the period of structural adjustments, but most of those structural adjustment policies actually only kick in in the 1990s. And it's really that they only end, you know, most countries you'll see, this is a massive shift of like three quarters of the world has bad policies. Yes, Sub-Saharan Africa, this one. And you'll see how the number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa with bad policies declines substantially to you know, rough even here in the mid 2000s to about one in uh, four. So from three in four to one in four. I think that's a massive decline, right? That's a substantial decline. And so when we start seeing growth here, you know, when they wrote the papers, those papers were written here, like Danny Rodrick's 2006. Um, his own work was in the early 2000s. It was too soon, he now says, for him to have judged the success of the Washington consensus. But actually, if you look at it now, with another 10, 10 years of available data, you clearly see it's, these, it's the reduction in the number of bad policies that helps to explain the better growth of African societies in the 2000s. So I guess the question is, can growth continue, right? And you know, they, just to kind of refresh, between 2001 and 2010, six of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world was African. Um, so Angola, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Chad, Mozambique, and Rwanda. So what you also see is that these are some of the poorest countries, which is amazing, right? That means that it's the, the poorest of the poor who benefit in the kind of global context, who benefit from, uh, from kind of uh, globalization uh, and growth. Um, of course, Ethiopia continued. Um, Ethiopia has done incredibly well in the 2010s as well. Um, uh, but some of these other countries have not. So Angola, for example, has, they continued for a couple of years and then there was a decline. So the question is, can this growth continue? And there's a great paper by uh, Frank Kummer and Van Weinberg. So this is uh, Evert and Marlouis's work. Um, and they caution against over-optimism. So I would say, I would say, I would position this paper. Uh, there are two Dutch scholars. Uh, Marlouis is now at Harvard. Uh, Evert is at Wageningen. And, and I think it's a fair analysis, but I think it is uh, quite a, um, a cautious uh, uh, analysis as well. Well, cautious is perhaps not the right word, maybe um, slightly conservative analysis. Um, so they give, um, I think, excellent reasons that require a response of why they suggest comparing Africa's current situation to the previous kind of Japanese situation before their period of industrialization and then Britain's in the 19th century uh, position and the kind of advantages that Britain had at that stage. So comparing the different periods of industrialization, they say, well, one should be cautious to expect a period of industrialization for Africa. And to some extent, I, I think I agree with that. And I agree with many of these reasons. So I'm quickly gonna run through them. The first is that they say, you know, Asian growth dependent on a large labor cost gap. Right, so basically between the difference between Asian wages and the rest of the world, um, given a certain level of productivity was large, right? So Asia could benefit from low wages given their high level of productivity. Africa doesn't have that advantage. African wages are actually relatively high given our, label, uh, our um, available level of productivity. So, so we don't have that advantage. Um, we should also keep in mind that industrialization, both in, in Britain and in Asia, didn't immediately translate into high living standards. There was almost a generation before living standards increase, right? And so the question is, would Africa be willing, would African societies at the moment, given that a lot of African countries are actually democratic, whether they would be willing to, um, to, to wait a generation to see living standards increase. Uh, population growth is higher in Africa it was also pretty high in Britain and in, in, in China um, or in, in, in Japan at that stage. 
but they were always typically escape valves. So additional surplus labor could move right from, from Britain to other parts of the world as part of the British Empire um, expansion. That's not the case in Africa at the moment. There certainly it's much more difficult to, for labor to move today than it was a century ago. Um, and Africa has lost much of its historical artisanal skills, they argue, right? So especially in West Africa, a deep history of, of um, uh, artisanal skills, for example, in textiles. And given this period of deindustrialization almost in Africa, um, it must be that some of those skills have been lost and it's gonna be difficult to, 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 to kind of pick up again. And then um, growth in Britain um, and, and Japan was somewhat supported by governments willing to forego freedoms, right? So Britain certainly wasn't a democracy when it industrialized and so too, um, you know, uh, most Asian countries also weren't democracies. So they could forego some of the personal freedoms um, and almost kind of force through industrialization. And that's not the case in many African countries today. So, that, so I would say it's slightly, you know, pessimistic probably view of, of what is happening going forward. I would say, well, I think there are other reasons to be optimistic. And I, my suspicion is, and, and I'm, I'd be very keen to hear from, from the audience, um, is, uh, is that I think one should think of services rather than of manufacturing. And that's really the key for, for Africa going forward. Um, you know, this is just a picture of, of kind of a couple of um, venture capitalists. It's a venture capital firm in Africa who is investing in all sorts of ICT technology, right? And, and so that's clearly to me uh, an, an important potential avenue for, for growth. Um, so think, for example, of you know, the accounting firm in Lusaka, Zambia, who trains their accountants with the highest qualifications, British qualifications. And so now they can do the auditing services of firms in the UK. They fly in their accountants. They stay in London for three weeks. They do the books. They fly back. And then they do all the accounts uh, back in Zambia. Or even nowadays, they don't even have to fly in. They can simply use Zoom. Um, and they can charge a quarter of the price than what PwC would charge in, in the UK. And, you know, um, this kind of group of, of, um, of Zambian accountants and the Zambian business obviously does, does very well. It's, they don't have to service a local market. They, they export Zambian accounting services. On Friday, I, I had a meeting here with a, um, with a guy who, I, who is, is a, a mergers and acquisitions. He came for a visit to Stellenbosch. He's a mergers and acquisitions expert. He heads up a team of 90 uh, um, chartered accountants in South Africa, and they only do mergers and acquisitions analysis for big clients in America. So they don't do any kind of work on, Afri uh, on Africa or South African firms. They export their services to the US. It's a great, you know, instead of producing T-shirts or producing kind of manufactured goods and trying to export that to Europe or the US or wherever, now we see service, uh, services kind of industry professionals exporting their services. The question is, is this kind of a, you know, uh, kind of what was kind of classically known as a kind of a white collar type work? Or could this also filter down to say blue collar work? So, you know, that's a kind of important question to, to answer. I don't have the kind of uh, immediate uh, answer to that, but I can, I can see that there are potential opportunities to exploit there as well. Um, I don't see Africa becoming a major manufacturing hub in the near future, right? It's incredibly expensive to produce something within the continent and especially then to ship that out. Um, Africa is a large landmass. Its ports are far away, not on the main trade hubs. Um, uh, and it, trade costs are just uh, incredibly expensive. So our comparative advantage, to me at least, is in, in the services sector. And, and I hope to see that also being taken up in, in kind of policy making going forward. Bengi, you should say how much time I have, because I I've basically, I think I've reached the end of the hour, but I, I could also talk a little bit more about South Africa if, if, if there is still more time. There, there is still more time, Professor, for it, please. Okay. Yeah. okay. Cool, um, I'll, I'll take another 10 to 15 minutes or so. Okay, so let's turn a little bit. So that's, that's a story about Africa. Let's turn to, uh, to my own country, South Africa, um, and um, look at post 1994. So post apartheid South Africa, the democratic era, what has happened uh, in there? For those of you who did tune in on, uh, on, I think it was Wednesday's lecture, some of this might, might look uh, quite familiar. 
So I think the important thing is to just think about the country that the ANC inherited in 1994. And in 1998, um, the then uh, vice president, uh, Tawun Beki, who would like to become president, um, gave this kind of wonderful speech where he said South Africa was uh, a country of you know, a two nation state. One is kind of poor and the other one is pretty rich. Now in that speech actually was, it was both right and wrong. And, the, and you know, it was right in the sense that uh, uh, on average, white South Africans were far more affluent and actually still remains far more affluent than black South Africans. But it was wrong in the sense that that hadn't been changing. And in fact, if you go back two decades from the 1970s onwards, you already see quite rapid changes happening at that stage. And partly the reason therefore was for political reasons, the national party at that stage, the apartheid government were trying to appease black South Africans in some way. And so uh, pensions, for example, for black South Africans were increasing, spending on education was increasing, pensions, for example, had become equal in 1993 already. Um, so there was a changing story. Inequality, for example, had been moving from a very clear white black difference to actually a class difference. So you would see uh, within group inequality, so within the white population would be increasing, but especially within black inequality would increase to the extent that in South Africa today, if, if all white South Africans were to um, you know, flee or be kind of uh, removed, then the Gini coefficient would stay exactly the same, right? So that's, um, so within race inequality, uh, is by far the most important inequality, level of inequality in South Africa at the moment, even though, I mean, partly that is, it's by construction because white South Africans is such a tiny share, 7% um, of the population uh, at the moment. So, so removing those kind of 7%, you still have a, a very unequal distribution in incomes, right? And so that's kind of important to keep in mind um, when, when going forward. And that was pretty relevant already by the, by the 1990s. Um, so what was, what was the attempt by the ANC government uh, after they came into power to fix this? Well, the first was a kind of a reconstruction and development plan, um, which was about redistribution in terms of access to services and especially housing. So large urban projects on the periphery of cities were launched to build houses for, um, for especially for those uh, households who had recently migrated from what was known as the former, or what's still known as the former homelands. Um, and uh, many of these households had settled on the kind of outskirts of, of the cities and these kind of small, uh, you know, tiny houses really were, were built to, 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 to house them uh, in an attempt to kind of, um, uh, to pr provide some form of, of basic service. In many cases, sadly, uh, ownership of those houses weren't, uh, provided with the house. So it was often, again, um, I, again, I say again, because this was, this was what was happening during the apartheid period for those that, uh, uh, for those that could move to South Africa, um, they could never own land. Um, and, and to some extent, this system continued into the, into the um, democratic era. And that's an important point that's still, you know, a major issue in South Africa today is the ownership of land and, and, and the buildings on it, of course. And then the kind of next plan in 1996 was gear. So, so our, the RDP was pretty successful at achieving what it hoped to do is to provide access to basic services. And that continued, but now kind of the macroeconomic policy um, was gear and the idea behind gear was to get growth and especially to get the kind of macroeconomic fundamentals correct, right? So when I was a student in the early 2000s, I remember you know, our macroeconomic lecturer asking us, do you think gear is a success? And we all said no. And he kind of almost fell off his chair thinking, you know, you know, <laughs> what does he have to work with here, given that we've all answered the question wrongly. Um, and thinking back, I mean, I realized why we, why, why we voted for no, because gear had hoped for six to seven to 8% growth. And we at that stage had only been achieving 4% growth. Now, you know, today South Africa would give everything for a 4% growth rate, but then we thought no, 4% is not enough. We are hoping for six, 7%. But actually the economy was doing remarkably well. Like the turnaround from the 1990s, the early 1990s to the mid 2000s was astonishing, right? And that's mostly the result of people like Tarvun Beki, Trevor Manuel and Titu Mbuen, right? The, those in charge of economic policy. Um, and to kind of just give you a sense of how successful it was, like inflation fell from 14 to 6%. Now, you know, just to, for those of you perhaps who's not familiar with economics, if you've got a 14% inflation rate, 
it's almost never that you fall back to 6% without like massive intervention. Usually if you've got 14% inflation, it rises, it keeps on rising and ultimately kind of, you know, you, you kind of have to uh, uh, devalue the, uh, the, the, the currency and all of these kinds of things, right? Dramatic, take dramatic steps. And somehow the ANC managed um, to, to bring that down back to 6%. Uh, I think the second one is the most startling one, right? So the ANC government inherits all of this apartheid era debt. Now it's much easy, you know, it's the easiest thing for them to go to the international markets and say, listen, this debt was incurred during a time of uh, an undemocratic era. We are now a democracy. We don't want to pay back the undemocratic debt. We will, we want to start fresh. And I'm pretty sure, you know, the international markets would have said, okay, we'll try and find an arrangement. But the ANC didn't do that. The ANC said, we will repay that debt because we want to prove ourselves, right? We want to build up a credit record that shows that we are a borrower with good standing. And in fact, that's exactly what they did. So from 50% of GDP by the mid 2000s, it was 27%, which is a remarkable achievement, right? And uh, the Minister of uh, Finance could actually in the mid 2000s announce a budget surplus, which is, you know, again, uh, given what has happened since, quite a remarkable achievement to, to, to see South Africa actually attaining a budget surplus. Now you might say, well, perhaps this came at, um, at a cost for the poor, right? Perhaps the, the poor had to give up some of their um, potential uh, um, income for, for these kind of macroeconomic, uh, what one might even consider kind of a Washington consensus approach. But actually I'll get back to this picture now. But actually, um, uh, you know, act, this was not the case. So if you look at GDP, not, not only did GDP grow, but the share of GDP that was paid to the poor increased incredibly uh, from 1.3% to 3.3%, right? It's a massive increase in the social grants that are allocated to the poor. And South Africa has the advantage that our social grants are actually incredibly well targeted, meaning that it actually goes to the poor. In many other developing countries, it's usually kind of the middle income that receives the social grants. But in South Africa, it's the poorest of the poor. Um, and there are historical reasons for that. Um, and you can even look at poverty. Poverty declined substantially on various dimensions. If you just look at the multidimensional index, which means it includes now things like access to housing, electricity, water, um, poverty fell from 37% to 8%. Right? That's you know, between 1993, I think, and, and 2010. Job growth was not so successful. So, and there are various reasons for that, but basically it comes down to the fact that yes, the economy was expanding, creating new jobs, but also South Africa was opening up to the international markets. We joined um, the WTO in 1995, and suddenly all these uh, uh, firms that were uncompetitive, you know, and could be uncompetitive during the apartheid era because of sanctions, now they had to compete with international firms. And so they had to kind of increase their productivity, which means that many of them also got rid of kind of excess jobs, meaning that wages for those that did have jobs increased, but those, um, but you didn't see much new job growth. So there was a lot of expansion of the economy, creating new jobs, but a lot of those firms that were there shedding some of those jobs to become in internationally competitive. So the aggregate share of, uh, of jobs available, the aggregate amount of jobs available didn't increase that much. And then finally, I think to say is that a lot of the microeconomics we got wrong, right? So the macroeconomics is an amazing success story, but the microeconomics, so in education and in health, right? I've mentioned HIV AIDS before, South Africa, of course, in 2000s with President Mekhi, a massive issue in terms of, you know, should we roll out anti antiretrovirals and also our education policy, um, our education system was, uh, you know, an unequal system during the previous apartheid era. And even though um, the transfers from government to schools had equalized between white and black schools or formerly white and formerly black schools, the outcomes in those schools remained, uh, in, the, in the formerly black schools remained dismal. And it still remains dismal to this day. It's a tragic story of, of not converting a large pot of money into the outcomes that is necessary for for kind of, you know, um, uh, the labor market uh, to benefit from highly skilled individuals. So let me just return to kind of this picture. I mentioned this, you know, so it's, there's a story of course of macroeconomics and microeconomics, but here's just a kind of an anecdote about uh, 
South Africa building an electric car. So this is 2000, South Africa uh, was building this electric car at the, well, sh showcased this, this electric car at the Paris um, Motor Show. This is the same year that Elon Musk is, is you know, beginning Tesla. Uh, also, you know, South Africa's electric car, the Jewel, was built with state subsidies. Those subsidies ultimately fell away during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and the program collapsed. You know, we know what has happened to Tesla since. Of course, Elon Musk also being a South African makes it even worse, right? Um, so, you know, we could have had a, a fleet of electric cars in South Africa already in the 2000s, right? Late 2000s. Um, but, uh, but that's basically, it gives you a sense of the optimism of the, of the country at that, at that time. What happens after 2007, 2008, 2009, right? So we have a shift in, it's the NC government still in power, but we have a shift in emphasis. So um, the state becomes more important. We see an increase, a large increase in the number of government employees, 2.2 to 2.7 million. We see a massive increase in their wages. So 22% higher, right? Not only 22%, but it's 22% higher than the private sector wages. Um, and so the government, the budget surplus, for example, vanishes almost immediately. There is a national development plan that must replace gear, and I must admit this plan is a good plan. But sadly, even though this plan emphasizes the role of state-funded or state-owned enterprises like ESCOM, the electricity provider, and Transnet, the, um, the transportation the, the, you know, company that runs the trains, um, there's a lot of corruption that um, and I think I'm pretty sure most of you would be familiar with that kind of story. So I'm not even going to read kind of quote. And there's obviously Zonda reports that are coming out as, you know, as I speak almost and, and um, uh, providing us with more information of, of just um, the amount of what is known as state capture that happened in South Africa during this period. And ultimately, the point is that many of these state-owned enterprises, either they collapse or they, you know, become so inefficient that South Africa now for the last five or six years, uh, even longer, I think, has what we know as kind of... Um, load shedding or, you know, it's a euphemism for, for electricity blackouts. Um, um, and so the kind of ultimate story is that South Africa turns around. So here's a, a graph of the, the decline, you know, an, an amazing story, a global story of a decline in poverty around the world, right? You'll see even, you know, in Africa, this is the, the period where people had said, well, there's no hope, the hopeless continent. So we also see that there's no decline in poverty, but then we see, a rapid decline, right? And this is 60% of people being poor in Africa to 40%, right? So that's a 20 percentage points difference. That's massive. That's hundreds of thousands, millions of people um, that are now escaping poverty. We see the same in South Asia. Look at this remarkable decline. The average for the world is, you know, incredibly impressive. And then in South Africa, we see a period of rapid decline. But then in 2010, this is the financial crisis, and then in 2010, we see this turnaround, right? And that's continuous, even if you have more recent, uh, recent data. So let me end by, by so what is my future um, kind of view of these things? And it's, it's all kind of used as metaphor of the World Cup, because I like it, and I, you know, I think football speaks to many of us. So, um, so uh, just before the World Cup in 2010, I attended a lecture by a professor um, who was speaking at UCT, a visiting professor. And he said, he asked the question, how do you win the World Cup? And um, do you, he said, do you appoint a very expensive Brazilian coach? Right? And of course, that's exactly what South Africa had done. We had appointed Carlos Pereira. Um, uh, I just checked the numbers the other day. He was appointed to 3 million rand per month at that stage which translated with that, with that um, exchange rate at that time was about uh, $500,000 a month. Right? So that's a pretty steep, steep salary. So do you appoint a very expensive Brazilian coach? And of course, South Africa did okay. We didn't escape the group rounds, but we did beat France in this game that I was fortunate to attend. Uh, we you know, sadly lost against Uruguay and drew Mexico in the opening game. So it's not, it's not terrible performance, but unfortunately not good enough. Um, or he said, do you give every kid in South Africa a soccer ball? So you're not going to win the World Cup in 2010 if you do that, right? You're not going to win the World Cup in 2014, and you're not going to win the World Cup in 2018. But by 2022, which is, you know, this year, you might have a chance because every kid in South Africa would have played soccer. The best of them would have been, you know, chosen by the local teams, and the best of them would have been picked by the or bought by the kind of um, 
uh, PSL teams, and the best of them would have probably gone and played in, in Europe, right? And so you would have had 11 players that would probably now be playing in Europe, young guys. So they might not win the 2022 World Cup, but by 2026, you would have a world-class team. And so I like this as a question about how do you think about economic policy? Do you have this top-down you know, command council, as we have in South Africa, who dictates what should happen? You know, where should we produce what? Where should we build cities? What should we, you know, what type of uh, electricity supply should we have? All of these kind of top-down decisions. Or do you give every kid in South Africa an economic soccer ball? Now, you might ask, what is that? And that's open for debate, right? Perhaps that's access to Wi-Fi, right? Just make sure everyone has access to fast internet, right? To help educate themselves. Or um, you might think of perhaps give everyone a solar panel. That's a bit of a kind of a, a uh, strange one, but the point is to not have one centralized power producer, but to decentralize that in some way so that people can produce their own power or have at least access to regular uh, power. Or you might think of other kinds of policies that link up with education or health, um, you know, access to good nutrition at a young age, all of these kind of things. So you're not going to, with those type of policies, have a growth rate of 10% in the next year or even five years from now. But in 10 to 15 years, you're gonna have a far better educated, far more optimistic uh, society that it can actually take opportunities to participate in the fourth industrial revolution, which I think is probably the way to go, but it's of course, incredibly difficult for a, um, in a political system where the horizon is only in a five-year time span. So yes, uh, a political party must be elected within five years. They must win the World Cup in five years. They don't have 15 or 20 years to plan. And sadly, I think we lose a lot of the potential in our society, the potential football players that can do amazing things um, with, with that kind of uh, view. So I leave it there and I'm, I'm happy to field any, any questions uh, if there are. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Furi, for that very uh, insightful educative, enriching discussion of uh, Africa's economic history. We're extremely grateful once again that you made the time to be with us today and share with us these wonderful insights. Uh, before we move into the Q&A session, I wanted to, re to recap what you have gone through because we've covered quite a lot of ground, uh, starting with the evolution of the scholarship, the study of Africa's economic history from the schools of thought that you have uh, taken us through from the modernization theory, dependency, Marxist, uh, the Annal school, postmodernism, the quantitative school that I think Hopkins calls the, uh, the new school uh, of African economic history. And then to move into the post-structural adjustment era in Africa, and the so-called turn of fortunes with the uh, turn of the century, the 21st century, and then sort of zeroing in on the experience of South Africa uh, in the post-apartheid democratic era uh, and how they have uh, managed to perform economically the fluctuations in, in, in their fortunes. Uh, quite loaded, very heavy, Stuff, but I trust that uh, the uh, participants have been able to uh, pick some useful insights from that. And now we shall open up for the Q and A. We already have one question in the chat. I want to encourage uh, the rest of our audience, uh, Professor Furi, as we informed you, we have folks from across uh, Africa with us here, as you might have seen in the chat, as folks were introducing themselves folks from Ethiopia, folks from Liberia, folks from Uganda, uh, folks from South Africa, Kenya, across the continent. Uh, and so I want to invite participants, please uh, post your questions in the chat. The first question we have there is from uh, uh, Olemo, who is asking, how do we define bad policy and economic growth as it pertains to evaluating the impact of structural adjustment programs? I think he hinted on those two things initially. What is bad policy as per the, the, the research that you cited? And how do you understand economic growth generally within the academy? Cool. Um, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So, so I've actually just posted um, a link to the paper. I think it's an NBR paper, so it should be free 
freely available um, to read. There, there's a host of ways that they uh, define the kind of bad policies, but I'll summarize it by simply saying that it's it's unsustainable spending, right? So as soon as you spend more than the kind of revenue, of course you can borrow, um, but ultimately someone has to pay, some you know future taxpayer in your country has to pay. So the idea is there that bad policies are basically policies that are that are um, where your where your spending exceeds your your kind of uh, expect, expected revenue in the future. Um, but I, as I have kind of mentioned, this this uh, the link is there and it should that should be a um should clarify things i think the way to think about economic growth is is that it remains you know there are many issues with economic growth in the way we construct gdp gross domestic product um we've done that since the 1940s and of course economic historians now take that back even to earlier times um and and there are a lot of things that gdp um, excludes as well things like leisure things like uh, domestic work um so and and economic historians certainly are not uh you know we're not shy to discuss the the uh, critiques of um of gdp but i do think one should keep in mind always that gdp is correlated highly correlated actually with all the good things that we want our you know our citizens and people to have so higher levels of gdp typically means lower poverty right uh, and dramatic declines in poverty. So you know, you can just look at China, between eight and twelve percent GDP growth in the '90s and 2000s. Remarkable declines in uh, poverty. Um, so that's just, I mean, that's to me uh, the strongest indicator. The second one would be infant mortality, for example. Things like how many babies die in the first year of life or in the first five years of life, and and a country with high levels of GDP growth sees dramatic declines in that right so on average the world in the year 1900 had about you had about 43 kids out of a thousand dying of um you know some kind of disease in the first year now it's four right that's a it's a factor of 10 increase and of course there's massive variation across countries some countries certainly in african countries still have relatively high infant mortality some of the world's you know richest countries in japan for example it's 0.4 so it's you know it's much much better even yeah. um but the point is really that the gdp is is it's not a perfect measure but it's a measure that really correlates very well with all the things that we care about okay thank you for that dr Furi. the next question is coming from uh, your fellow south african raylene who is asking how do we force politicians to take the long-term view because when you as you concluded you alluded to the World Cup metaphor. And uh, Raylene is asking, how do we get politicians who have that incentive of getting reelected within four to five years, who have the incentive, pressure, if you will, to win the World Cup in five years, to yeah. take that long term view? Is there anything citizens can do to bring about, to bring that pressure to bear on uh, policymakers? Yeah, I, I think there's the kind of, you know, the answer I probably should give to, is, is to say, well, you know, we should, that should be reflected in our votes. But I don't think that's how things actually. I mean, obviously, we should, you know, vote for the for the party that that we believe has the best long-term policy. But but I think ultimately, it's not even through politics that these things happen. It's through civil society engagement, right? So we often think only of kind of government and the private sector, and of course, they have an important role to play. But we forget about the third arm, right? The civil society participation, and this ranges, you know, from academic societies to you know sport clubs to church groups all the kind of things that organizes um you know human rights uh, ngos all of these kind of things i would group as civil society and it's often those kinds of groups that i think has an important role to have an important role to play uh, in in aligning the government with the longer term outcomes like reminding them you know, through the media, for example, is a, is a powerful instrument, um, of course, in those places where the where the media is free, which is why the media should be free, um, because it's in those kinds of where the, where the pressure can come from the outside on politicians, not necessarily, of course, it would be wonderful through the ballot box, but often it's through these other kinds of channels that I think, you know, through churches or through through NGOs that, that can put pressure um, with with policy experts, right, within their midst. So so even think tanks, right, policy think tanks can can play an active role in doing the research and showing the benefits of certain types of policies. 
So I think that's that's my hope is, is the way to, to do it. All right, thank you, Dr. Free. Now, I, I do have uh, some questions that are coming through here. Um, let's talk briefly about the evolution of the study of African economic history. With the exception of the dependency school, all the other sort of paradigms, if you will, schools of thought that have emerged for the study of uh, Africa's economic history, whether it is the modernization theory, whether it is Marxist, the annals, the postmodernism, they all take for granted that Africa is trying to do some sort of catch up, if you will, that we're trying to create in Africa uh, and some to go even to say in the same way, we're trying to create Europe. Let me even put it in those blatant terms to create the, the, the feat that has been achieved in the West, in Africa, mm. in terms of quality of life, ways of life, and some of those schools of thought, uh, such as the modernization theory, in fact, want to replicate how it was done elsewhere within Africa itself. Do you, do you see any limitations in that approach to the study of African economic history? Because if the, if the approach is, we have seen what is good, that is what has happened in countries that we consider to be developed and advanced ahead of us, we're now going to borrow those concepts, to borrow those frameworks, to borrow those lenses and bring them to bear on our analysis and prescriptions of what Africa ought to aspire to and how it ought to do that. Hmm. I, I think that's a great question. And I, I'm gonna give you, I don't, I don't necessarily have the answer, but I'm gonna give you one example. So this paper that I referred to by Yevot and Marluz, right? So they are great scholars. They are excellent historians of Africa, economic historians of Africa, where they set out basically why it's gonna be very difficult for Africa to industrialize in the you know, next couple of decades. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a I think it's a good analysis, right? I and I I don't have any con, you know qualms with that. But again, it's it's based on the idea of a model that a country has to go from agriculture to industry and then to services. Mm -hmm. And and so the approach that I would say is well, can we not think of an Africa where we skip the middle step, mm -hmm. right? We are we are not clearly as they point out, we are not going to be able to industrialize, right? It's it's just the the costs, the labor costs are too high, the trade costs are too high. We simply cannot compete with you know Bangladesh or Vietnam or whatever is the kind of leading Asian country of the time in terms yeah. of manufacturing. So how do we, and this is the challenge I would have for the next generation is like, how do we imagine a society that is based on service exports, right? What does that look like? That looks obviously very different from, you know, a big factory with a lot of blue collar workers coming in every day. And it looks very different from the America type of city, but I don't know what it looks like. I cannot imagine how that city, a city like that in Africa looks like right? where you have, we have thousands of, you know, does it look like there's thousands of coffee shops and everyone pitches every morning in a coffee shop and they, and they kind of, you know, do their service or is it, is it some other kind of model? I don't know, but, but I think that's the challenge we have. No, you, 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 you alluded again to the, to the point on services, which you also talked about as one of your prescriptions in terms of, you, you say you do not see Africa industrializing anytime soon because of the labor cost advantage that other parts of the world still have ahead of us and that it would be more strategic to focus on the services sector. Uh, it sounds appealing, and I think uh, I, I will need to give it more thought. The question I have for you, however, is when you look closely, many of these African countries, of course, with the exception of South Africa, that had an industrial uh, uh, head start relative to the rest of the continent, most of the growth that has happened recently, the economic expansion, uh, has led to a restructuring of economies by in terms of how much different sectors contribute to GDP in favor of services. Mm -hmm. I can give you the example of Uganda, for example. Mm -hmm. In Uganda, we have had uh, about 7% sustained growth over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Impressive by any feat globally. Mm -hmm. That hasn't brought about the industrial revolution that we had hoped for, that structural transformation from mm -hmm. agriculture to uh, you know, manufacturing and industry. But, in the, but services now constitute about 45% of GDP. Yeah. The challenge with services, however, uh, is that they're not labor intensive. Yeah. They, and because of technology, again, it means that human work, human labor is substitutable. So yeah. from that prescription that, that you give about, you know, trying to leapfrog others by focusing on what our comparative advantage seems to be now, which is in services, mm 
when you consider the fact that services are not labor intensive uh, uh, and that technology advancements have made service delivery even less labor intensive, how do we then solve the problems that are sitting in countries like South Africa with the highest yeah. unemployment rate, probably in the world? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great question. I, I mean, again, if I knew the answer, I would be, I would be rich, right? <laughs> but, but let me again give you a, uh, just a flavor of like the most labor intensive sector in South Africa at the moment is a service sector, right? It's yeah. tourism, right? And it employs the poorest of the poor, right? Especially those that are close to cities, right? Because they ultimately, you need uh, service workers in the tourism industry. Of course, COVID was devastating for that. Yeah. So, so that's another kind of service that we tend to kind of forget. And, and of course, many African countries, certainly Uganda, would have a would have a great comparative advantage in flying in tourists um, yeah. uh, to see to see the wonderful the pearl of Africa. I think Winston Churchill yeah. called. So, so, um, so I think one needs to think of creative ways. I I can give another example. I mean, these are just anecdotes, right? So they probably you know this is going against the kind of typical approach that I follow. But but the point is that you can get. I have a student who I gave a bursary to. And at some stage, she said, Johan, I don't need your bursary anymore. And I was like completely bowled over. Like, that's the first time a student ever told me they don't need a bursary. Because she's earning a massive salary writing, you know, what I would call simple newspaper articles for like an American newspaper. They send her the information every day. She writes the article. It takes her about two hours to do a couple of articles, sends them back. And as America wakes up, they've got all the news. Right. Um, and she earns a great. And so, so yes, it's not a labor intensive, you know, you're employing a thousand people, but I think each, I think the, you should think of it not as like a lot of people doing the same type of thing. It's a lot of doing people doing all different kinds of things. So that's why I mentioned the coffee shop, right? You've got, you don't have one factory floor where everyone does the same kind of screw, you know, you screw in the kind of, you know, I don't know, whatever the um, builds the engine. Yeah. It's, it's about, everyone doing something, uh, a little bit kind of part-time work here, a little bit of uh, doing, but earning in foreign currency. Right. And, and that's really the type of exports. And one can think of it, uh, you know, there's business process outsourcing that is to some extent, this kind of factory floor type labor intensive work, right? So the mm -hmm. nice thing about Africa is that we, we situated on the same, same time zone as Europe. We speak English or French, the two main European languages. Mm -hmm. So um, so again, this, you know, um, there's a lot of benefit for us in trying to kind of sell to that to that market, right. um, but but I think we need to be we need to think of creative ways. One of the fastest growing uh, sectors in South Africa at the moment is is actually cosmetic surgery, yeah. um, and so what you have is these English, uh, let's call them English tourists that come in, they do some cosmetic surgery in Cape Town, and then they go on a on a safari with a nurse. They pay huge you know pounds for that kind of experience. And, 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 you know, there's so many links to the local industry. It's the nurse, of course, the, the hospital staff, but also everywhere they travel, right? They are, they are people that are employed to kind of service them. So I think we need to think creative ways of how, how to achieve that. The alternative to me is not clear. That's, that's right. really the, the, that's the point. I don't know, I don't know what's, what, I don't know what else to hope for. Okay. So that, okay. I'm not sure if that's a positive explanation. Right. Yeah. Let, let, let's continue with the an immanent critique of the of the mainstream paradigm that we have today. Uh, some want to call it neoliberal, free market, and what have you. So you make the point about, you know, it doesn't have to be that one sector in services, one subsector in services employs everybody, but different subsectors within 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 services. Um, but one question that, that brings up there is if we are arguing that industrialization, which, which I, I still do not understand, but this is what research is telling us. Industrialization in Africa has failed to take up largely because of the labor cost and disadvantage that we have. When we look at our people and how, I, I don't know why labor is expensive on the continent, but given that it is expensive, because that's what research is telling us, how does that then tally with a, a focus on services? which seem to me to require more, uh, more advanced labor, which would definitely cost more. Do we have an advantage, a labor cost advantage within services that makes it a feasible alternative relative to continuous, co continuing to pursue industry or manufacturing? Yeah, I, I think it's, a, again, a great question. I think one should just think of absolute 
numbers here, right? So, so China, so just think about the size of China and India compared to Africa, right? So China, there's more people living in, in China than there are in Africa as a total, right? So, um, so just the, the sheer number of, of, of uh, and even, you know, having said that, Chinese wages are, ri are rising. So, mm -hmm. so the competitive advantage that China used to have is now kind of seeming to decline. And so that's why kind of these low cost manufacturing uh, firms are now shifting to say Bangladesh, right? Which is right. another kind of relatively poor country or Indonesia or so forth. And again, Bangladesh, hundred millions of, of people, Indonesia uh, as well. So it's just that, that, you know, relatively speaking to those countries, those labor abundant countries, Africa's labor is relatively expensive. Um, so that's really, uh, you know, given a level of productivity. So that's really key, right? You've got a large education sector in those countries as well. So education levels are relatively high. Um, um, and, and so the low cost um, manufacturing typically just makes sense. So that's the, the labor part of the equation, but there's also, and I think one that is completely missed often is the, is the transportation cost, right? So to, to export, um, uh, any manufactured goods, say from Malawi or from Lesotho, or you know even Zimbabwe or Zambia, is incredibly expensive if you don't fly them out, right? So if you take, if you have to take a train, you have to cross multiple countries' borders, then you get to a port which is it's very far from the manufactured place, and then you have to ship it on a route that is not very frequently used. It's just going to be three or four times the cost of what you pay for shipping something out of Shanghai um, to the US. So we, we simply cannot compete, right? You know, if you, if you produce something in Masiru, just imagine the kind of journey it has to take to get to Durban and then to the US. So, so that's just, and that's not going to change soon, right? Except if we have some kind of amazing innovation like a, you know, a Hyperloop or something, but that, even that's going to be crazily expensive. So it's just, it's not going to change. And so we need to think of alternative types of, um, so maybe it's producing things that other places cannot do, right? And that's kind of what we're doing with minerals is that, we have minerals and others don't, and so we can export those. Right. But that's also obviously not sustainable. So we need to think of a, of another way. Um, and, and I think here it's about what we can fly out. So perhaps we can produce things that we can fly out, yeah. uh, right? Instead of just transporting, but then it can't be cars, right? You can't fly out cars. So it has to be something else that is tiny, but that's gonna be a small uh, sector compared to, I think what we need is a kind of the services, services sector. So. That at the moment, I mean, it's an optimistic interpretation of things, but I just don't think we can focus all our attention on industrialization and repeatedly fail because then we, you know, if you make the same mistake twice um, or three times, that's just silly. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that response. Uh, a few more questions within the critique of the paradigm, and then there are a couple of questions that are outside of it that are, that are coming through in the chat. Uh, but the next question would be uh, you, you, seem, you seem to to be sympathetic uh, to, to, continue, to continuing pursuing growth within uh, a you know, market-driven approach. Free the markets and they, they'll do wonders, they'll do magic. One thing that uh, this Tangaza series has uh, brought to the fore is that when you choose a mode of production, you're also choosing attendant social relations. And I think we have Karl Marx to thank for that analysis. Uh, when we decide to go capitalist, there are certain attendant social relations that are born of that, a culture that emerges, they are wrong. And we, haven't, we, we, we must look no further than, than the US or Europe to see what has become of those societies given the mode of production that they have chosen. Now, you may not agree with Marx about you know, how the mode of production translates into a superstructure of culture, of beliefs, of religion, and what have you. But he's onto something to say that the what we produce is going to affect how we relate to each other. Part of the skepticism that Tangaza has brought for myself and I believe for many of our participants is that while it is possible that if we continue to pursue market-centered growth and development, we can attain improved living standards measured by increasing abundance in material goods uh, and reductions in you know, some bad stats, you know, maternal mortality, infant mortality, poverty rate, and what have you. The resultant way of living, if you look at, if we were to look at Europe and the US as reflections of what our future would look like if we pursued that kind of growth, 
it's not inspiring. Even China that has currently grown and pursued growth by that path, it's, it's not the most uh, attractive way of life that one wants to live. So I'm curious to say, do you think that, uh, to ask that, that trade-off between the, 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 the quality of life, not the quality, the kind of life that one chooses implicitly by choosing a mode of production, how much must we take into consideration? How much of that must we take into consideration when deciding how to grow, how to develop? Of course, I think, I think you have to take that into consideration. And I think there I would want to say we are probably too unimaginative in the ways of thinking through the types of capitalism that we can see. So I, I think when we use the word, I, I rarely use the word capitalism because I think it means <laughs> something different for everyone. Um, but, but, I, but I think I would want to say, let's think about ways that, that we can um, use free enterprise to empower people, right? So what are the types of ways that you can empower people? Well, obviously just, you know, having a job, certainly in South Africa, that's, that's already some form of empowerment because 50% of South Africans don't have a job. But, that, but, but I think capitalism is, you know, broadly defined, shifting towards a model where um, it's not just a, you know, a landlord or, a, or a, you know, the owner of capital employing a team of laborers. I think that that model is a 19th century model that clearly Karl Marx, you know, critiqued and was a relevant critique for its time. But I think the more I see types of businesses appear exactly here in Stellenbosch, which is a kind of innovation capital, is almost all of the employees have shares in the business. Now that's almost a kind of socialist model, right? That's like you are now owning part of the production, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and and I think more of those kinds of certainly in the venture capital space, you see a lot of those kinds of models. Now that's something to I think applaud, right? It's it's a, a very different model from the from the previous century, certainly two centuries ago. Um, and certainly the experience of colonialism in Africa, where you had mostly foreign firms coming in, employing a large pool of labor. And then, you know, when things got bad, they kind of exited and, and you know, a lot of people lost their jobs. I think once you start participating, once you're a, uh, 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 an employee with, with kind of a foot in the business, with the shares, uh, share options, the whole kind of dynamic changes. And so that what you meant with social relations, suddenly it's not like, the owners of capital versus the workers, you almost don't need a trade union in a sense when you've got that because everyone is now an owner of, of the business. And that creates the kind of right, I think, model. And the, and the question to me is like, why, why don't we see, well, we see to some extent a lot of that in the venture capital space, but why are we not celebrating more of those kinds of models? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's a, I mean, that's, I think if you gave that model to Karl Marx, you would have said this is exactly the way to go, right? This is where you would see, like, the, you know, those that that kind of produce that 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 um, that that that, that um, are kind of giving their labor are not only contributing to the surpluses of the of the you know capitalist. It's actually that they themselves then benefit. Um, yeah. And there's you can even go one step further. And I'm just going to leave this here, kind of, to, you know, we can think of it even in a more, perhaps this is a slightly kind of crazy idea, but think of instead of governments taxing citizens or businesses, why don't um, you know, governments to some extent um, also distribute shares in these companies? So, so imagine a, a company saying, we're not gonna pay a 20% or 25%, I think South Africa is on 27% tax to government every year, but we are, sh we are distributing our um, shares to an electorate. Mm -hmm. Now everyone in society owns shares, say in ShopRite, right? And so when you go and buy in ShopRite, yes, you obviously get the consumer, you're buying a cheap good, but you also know that you, you're in some kind of weird way, you are actually uh, benefiting from that in the long term. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, just the final thought is that technologies like in South Africa, we've got uh, easy equities where, where even the poorest guy who wants to invest just five Rand, right, in the stock markets can now do that. Um, um, and so I think we'll, we're seeing a, a, a fundamental shift in the kind of social relations, what you refer to, the kind of capitalism that we thought of, yeah. uh, where, where everyone can now own shares. And, and that's really the way to go.
Yeah, no, that's that's certainly a, a good a good illustration of what is possible. Alternatively, I think the only challenge would be that if the if the model of capitalist accumulation has been we want to concentrate hands, we want to concentrate capital in the hands of a few, those who can then reinvest it productively, then this redistribution that is going to encourage more consumption can be a break on growth, which many economists are concerned with. But uh, we can go on about that question. I want to move on to the other questions that are coming through. The next one that is within the, the, the paradigm before we move to the uh, others is, you also seem to, 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 you know, to have bought into Bill Stanley's uh, reappraisal of his earlier critique of the failure of structural adjustment, arguing that maybe we're too fast and too harsh to judge the failure of structural adjustment. But uh, I'm, I'm, conf I, I'm sure you are familiar with the uh, literature that is uh, critiquing the so-called Africa rising narrative, which argues that in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, there has been slowed down, a slowdown in the growth rates of African economies compared to what it was in the initial decade uh, of the 21st century. And many are attributing that to the increases in a, in a to the, to, the, to the slump in commodity prices that happened in the aftermath of global financial crisis. Now, if we are trying to tease out which carries more weight, is it improved policies that were nudged, courtesy of the structural adjustment, or is it buoyant demand uh, of the commodities driven by China that has now con contributed to the recent resurgence in growth between 2000 and, and 2010? It mm -hmm. seems to me that the depression in the growth numbers for Africa post 2014 can be attributed to the, the, the slump in commodity demand and commodity prices, which then takes away the shine from better policies. Uh, I wonder what you'd respond, how you'd respond to that. Mm. Yeah. We want to give emphasis to good policy, but clearly yeah. uh, uh, demand for commodities is playing a huge part, such that when that demand, anything happens to it, we're going to see a significant fall in uh, yeah. the performance numbers that we are cherishing. Yeah. So certainly commodities played, a, played an important role in the 2000s. So it's not to deny that commodities played, played a role at all, but I think it's interesting to kind of look at the types of countries, right? So, so the way to test this, um, because you build, you kind of, you're, you've got a great hypothesis there, right? You're testing the hypothesis, whether it's commodities or whether it's the policies. Mm -hmm. So the way to test that is to actually ask which of the countries saw kind of an increase in GDP during that period. And was that because of commodities in those specific countries? Um, and actually, if you look at most of, well, several of those countries are like Angola is clearly oil producing. So that's commodities, right? That, that's not a necessarily a change in policies. But a country like Ethiopia is not known for its commodities. It's actually a, a policy shift that clearly made a massive difference in, in Ethiopia in the 2000s and has continued even during the, current, the, the commodity slump. Um, yeah. And so Angola is a good example of a commodity increase. And then decline in 2014, and, and you know now Angola is again struggling. Um, Ethiopia, um, even even a country like you know Botswana, who has obviously clearly benefited a lot from diamonds, but has tried to kind of diversify. Um, Mauritius clearly doesn't have a lot of commodities; has been probably one of the main uh, outstanding performers. Um, so so, you know, <laughs> I guess an economist would answer it's a little bit of both, right? You're not you're not um, but, but I think what we tend to forget is that um, the point of the paper there is really just to say we've got a very specific view. You know, certainly I and, and many of my students from other African countries have a strong view about uh, structural adjustment programs. And, and I think the, what the point of the papers that are coming out are, is just to say, well, let's not, let's not be over just make judgmental about the um, the kind of effect of them and perhaps those effects actually were were quite important for for what happened two decades later of course the important question one should ask in a kind of history setting is what was the counterfactual right so what would have happened in 1980 if countries didn't adopt those structural adjustment programs well they were insolvent right so so the potential crash was even worse right if they couldn't pay their debts countries would have you know you have to ultimately uh, service your debt, and if you can't, then then the government collapses, and and you have to um, you know you kind of bankrupt. Yeah. Um, the currency would devalue, massive inflation. Um, so it could have been 
much much worse uh, but we don't know because we don't we, we only have one observation mm -hmm. done. Right. Um, right. but i think that's kind of a useful thing to keep in mind yeah no that's that's a good segue to the questions that are now sort of stepping out of the paradigm Bula is asking uh, uh still on the structural adjustment do you think there is a link between corruption and structural adjustment programs how can we do away with these programs and the negative effects they've had on the country on the country continent's economic development uh unemployment rate etc etc on the point of corruption i'm sure you've seen some literature on the extraversion of african economies because folks are now accountable to the international financial institutions of the imf and the world bank the need for accountability within local uh jurisdiction is is, is reduced so do you think there's a link between corruption and structural adjustment or that is spurious mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that literature very well, but that sounds like a, a, a plausible hypothesis again, right? So again, we one, one should test that empirically and see whether there is actually a correlation. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how you would identify the causal link, but, uh, but theoretically it makes sense that as soon as, you know, it's not only the IMF and the World Bank, it's donors generally, right? So once a politician is, is funded by a donor rather than by a, an electorate, Mm -hmm. um you're you're obviously going to ensure that you service the donor and not service the electorate um yeah. you're gonna uh you're gonna what's it the pay the hand that feeds you or something so so i think um so that makes that makes a lot of sense um i think um there's also quite a big literature on kind of favoritism um in in africa so and and they're the the one kind of famous study shows that there's also it depends on what type of a criteria is put in place at the stage of the kind of aid or the donation yeah. um, because that kind of makes a big difference and i think the paper shows that you know chinese donations for example or chinese aid is more likely to to go towards kind of uh projects the kind of white elephant projects right these projects that are building a stadium or building a statue for the leader or whatever um then then say kind of official development aid from from the west um, that's not to say the West's the aid is always fantastic because also what we know is that often it forces countries to use the experts or the the you know capital of those countries. So so famously, there's a study uh, which shows that um, during uh, good seasons, uh, harvest seasons in the U.S., uh, there's a surplus, say, of wheat that is produced, and then there's a surplus of uh, development aid going to Africa uh, because there's the surpluses that they basically need to get rid of these farmers and the US government. And so they basically dump all of these wheat on African farmers and it's uh, on African markets. And it's great obviously for consumers because they get cheap food, but it's terrible for African farmers who, who now have to compete against, you know, zero priced food basically. Mm -hmm. um, and and so, so that has a indirect, probably an intentional effect but it's an important effect, right? It crushes African agriculture. It allows, it disincentivizes new investments. Um, so, so certainly I think there's a, a link between kind of the, the development aid industry, both from a kind of institutional setting like the IMF and the World Bank, and especially from the official development assistance in, in countries and what is happening on the continent. Um, and it's not always even directly through the kind of political system, but it might well be. Thank you. Uh, the next question is coming from Okoth, who is asking, um, do you think that international financial institutions serving Western interests have massively crippled Africa under the guise of development and aid? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's I, I, am, I am less optimistic about the benefits of aid than I think, say, some of, the, some of my peers. I think you, you always are, you know, I, I, you can just see it up at an individual level, right? So if, 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 if there's a, if someone becomes dependent on, as a beggar, on a society that, you know, gives alms, there's a very high chance that that person will never escape that situation in their life, right? They, they will continue to live as a beggar simply because there's enough, um, there's a, enough of the society of people supporting them. And so they can sustain a, a level of, of, um, livelihood that that allows them to survive. Um, so so, but I'm not entirely sure how you shift from a current system where some countries do rely on development aid 
to say then, okay, now we are not receiving that development aid, but obviously that will have a crushing blow mm -hmm. in many cases on mm -hmm. those societies. So that shift is going to be very difficult. But I just think one one should be very cautious to to you know rely on development aid because it creates all these other kinds of dependencies that that ultimately is not going to allow for a for a thriving flourishing civilization right that's right. that's what we want we want to kind of see us innovate and 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 become entrepreneurs and i don't think that happens in a society where you rely on development aid right no thank you uh we have about 10 more minutes and we'll take about three or four more questions one is coming from Garang. Garang is asking that for an economy that predominantly relies on one particular export that uh, and imports much else, like, like South Sudan, I think this is where Garang is from, uh, how, can, how can such be used to propel other sectors of the economy, especially when faced with the enormous budgetary needs? So if we have one predominant export commodity, oil, coffee, tourism, how does that propel economic growth in other sectors? Mm. Yeah, Garang, thanks. It's a great question. It's obviously incredibly difficult for a country like South Sudan, who um, you know, also lacks, for example, kind of administrative capacity. It's not like you have suddenly the, the bureaucracy of a um, you know, an advanced society with kind of highly educated administrators that are, you know, giving their full attention to, to these kinds of questions. It's, you have to mitigate, or you have to kind of deal with these kinds of issues in a very fragile and fledgling um, uh, society. So, so I think what the best kind of answer I can give here is, is to look at what, it, what other countries where there's been one central commodity, what they have done. Um, I suspect here um, the best, policy I can think of immediate policy is to, to set up something like a sovereign wealth fund where the surpluses of those exports do not go into the annual budget of the country, but is separ separated um, and run either by kind of a, um, you know, an expert panel or perhaps the returns, some of those returns are then allocated, reallocated back into the budget. But but the point is that that you need those you shouldn't spend those um, surpluses on, on kind of consumption uh, items, so on salaries of the government. Um, rather spend that surplus, you know, sovereign wealth fund on building the kinds of infrastructure that is necessary for your country to diversify. So, you know, in in uh, South Sudan's case, like you know, Juba could be a, a great place. It's on a river. It could be a trade hub. Um, so what is the type of infrastructure that's necessary there? Well, perhaps like a, an advanced port, right? That kind of links Juba to, to Khartoum or, um, so, so thinking about the kinds of infrastructure that connects you to trade uh, networks, uh, regional and perhaps international, maybe an international airport um, that allows you to kind of, you know, fly in or fly out kind of um, commodities. Maybe it's, it's reliable, secure power, uh, maybe renewables, selling some of the excess power perhaps to neighbors, all of those kinds of things require infrastructure investment. And so that's what I would use that kind of surplus for. Um, I think it's also important, the final point here is just that we don't necessarily know what, we cannot predict the future. So we don't know what infrastructure will necessarily be the best. So it's making, it's making decisions now based on what seems like the most thing, but also being flexible enough to know that in five years' time, there might be a wonderful new, you know, solar type technology that that needs to be incorporated. And it shouldn't be government running all of these businesses. It should be the kind of government in collaboration with the private sector that allows there to be kind of maneuvering around what type of infrastructure is necessary. So and that sounds a little bit vague, but but the point is that it's it's it should be kind of separate, I think, from the from the main budget of the government. I yeah, know, thank you. I think it came out clearly. So Rainwolf Fund uh, would be a good starting point. Uh, we have three more questions. One is uh, two from Olemo. Olemo is asking, the recommendation you have uh, that recognizes services as being the comparative advantage that Africa has vis-a-vis -vis industrialization, would that calculus change if you take into account uh, that we're on the verge of economic integration given uh, the African continent of free trade area? Does that change the, the, the balance of forces in terms of our advantage in industry 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis services, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, other developing regions of the world? Yeah, it's a great point, Brian. It's it's um, something that I haven't thought of enough, um, even though I know a lot about the intra-African kind of trade agreements. I, I still think that, you know, I, I was a, I was a, before I was an economic historian, I was a trade uh, economist. And the idea of African integration is an idea that's come, you know, many decades back. When I was a student, it was, we were on the cusp of, of integration. Now we have a, a FDA, but still, the actual costs of trading. If you go to the, you know, the border crossing between Zimbabwe and Zambia, you know, I was there a couple of years ago, those drivers wait five days to cross the border. Now, you know, if you've got any perishable product that you want to trade, like milk, that's just impossible, right? So, so, so the point is there needs to be a lot of investment still in both the hard infrastructure, like the bridges and the, and the roads, but also in the soft infrastructure, like the red tape that allows you to just, I mean, if you cross the border from France to Germany, you don't even know it, right? You just, you just drive on, like you don't even know there's a border. But, but like if we have a similar setting like that in Africa, yeah. then I can see manufacturing actually, you know, light manufacturing. I don't think we're necessarily again gonna produce cars, but we might produce cell phones. And so that could certainly, could certainly happen. Yeah, Professor, just to follow up on that question, you know, it sounds a bit like circular thinking, right? We are broke which means we don't have money and we're trying to get rich. But to be rich, we must, we must become rich first to afford building bridges and all these sorts of infrastructure. How do we break out of that circular thinking, right? We, we, need, we need money to build those things, but we don't have that money currently. And once we but borrow, we, those things yeah, get taken away by debt service. We don't need money to reduce the rules at borders, right? So there's a lot of things- for the hard, we need money for the hard infrastructure, right? Yeah, but I mean, the hard infrastructure is actually, there is already a bridge, right? So so mm -hmm. those guys are not waiting five days to cross the bridge. They're waiting five days to get through the customs officials, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so that is that is the main um, hard infrastructure, even though there's, there's a lot of attention to that. But it's actually not, I would say, the main constraint. The main constraint is the fact that, you know, once you get into Malawi, you stop three or four times by some kind of random guy next to the road that demands a payment. Right, that is that is the thing that you need to avoid, and that doesn't take money. That takes kind of the following of rules and regulations, um, and and the kind of and and that's it. You know, if it was just money, it could be solved easily. Right? So so that's also the the point is that it's it doesn't take money, but it's also incredibly difficult to solve because there are historic reasons for why those kinds of institutions have developed in those specific countries. And to, to turn around those institutions, to get rid of them or to change them to different kinds of institutions, that is a very difficult thing. And that's why it's taken so long. Um, yeah, so, so I don't think it's, it's, it's like we have to wait until we reach and then we can build it. We can do a lot of things already with, with uh, and there's, they, I must say there are attempts at doing that, right? So even the FDA is a, is a big shift in the, in the right direction, uh, but now we need to kind of have the change on the ground. And that's really the difficult part. All right, thank you. Two more questions. Uh, Olemo is asking uh, the counterfactual structural adjustment, whether it would, put, would have been possible for IMF and the World Bank to give these uh, loans, but allow the state to continue playing a prominent role in economic activity. I, I think uh, you hinted on that in your analysis. It wouldn't be possible because they, they blame had less squarely on uh, the state for outspending itself. But maybe yeah. you want to respond to that. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, you know, this is they, this, when you give a kind of a loan, I guess there's always the expectation that it must be repaid. Right. And at that stage, just uh, countries were spending too much given their level of economic growth. So again, in the early, in the late 60s, if you're growing at five, six, seven percent, it's it's easy to repay a loan at four percent, right? Because every year you, you have more to pay. And so mm -hmm. it's great. But once you start growing at two or one or minus three percent, it's almost impossible to repay that loan. And so I think that's partly what the purpose was of the structural adjustment is to just make sure that countries could actually repay, repay the loans. Um, okay, so there was, there was no faith that continued state economic activity would facilitate- would Exactly, yeah, uh, would, would kind of boost growth. Which is you know, largely an ideological point. Uh, but uh, Bananos has a question. Uh, he's asking that, okay, yeah, it's quite a, mouthful. He's giving the example of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire that produced the largest, the chunk of the world's cocoa, yet African chocolate markets are dominated by imported uh, goods. 
and is asking, uh, yeah, how yeah, yeah. do I, we? Yeah, you read the question. That's a, it's a great, it's a great question. So, um, I, I think two things here. I mean, I'm typically not someone that wants to uh, shift the blame to to you know follow the kind of um, I guess both the modernization school and the um, uh, kind of the Walter Rodney's uh, you know how Europe underdeveloped Africa kind of approach the dependency theory. Um, but but in this case, you know, a country like Switzerland have has massive tariffs on um, you know importing chocolate. So so you can import cocoa for very cheap, and then um, but you can't import chocolate. So so clearly that's something that must be addressed at a global level, and that's where the WTO, the World Trade Organization, must play a role is to make sure that that these rich countries are accessible to manufactured and you know higher level agricultural goods um, that they can, can that they can import. Um, and, and that's partly why you know Doha, the Doha round broke down because India and many African countries and many Latin American countries were insisting that this happens and it didn't happen. Right. Um, uh, many European countries still give ag agricultural subsidies. Strangely, agricultural subsidies seem see almost no media attention, right? But but we see a lot of attention given to development aid, but actually the best aid that Europe can give is to just remove their agricultural subsidies. Um, yeah. And that would allow African farmers to, to expand production up the value chain or down the value chain, however you want to see it, and, and produce chocolate rather than... Um, I don't think it's something that the government should mandate, right? I don't think the government should be in the, in the business of producing chocolate. I think the government should be trying to orchestrate at a global level the reduction of tariffs, even at the bilateral level. But typically, yeah. you know, Ghana doesn't have enough political power to negotiate with Switzerland. So it needs to happen at the WTO, but sadly right. that system has fallen down. And so I'm not sure how that will play out in, in future. Probably we'll see these regional blocks. So like, you know, the West African bloc or the FTA of Africa now negotiating a free trade agreement with, with the European Union. That's probably how things will happen in future. But right. I hope that that receives more attention. Yeah, no, the final question, of course, and it's related to the recommendations that you, you made in the paper that you uh, prescribed for reading today. Um, of course, he's asking, what is the main reason for the failure of experts, one after the other, who are suggesting feasible solutions to Africa's economic challenges? I think that question speaks to several parts. One of the recommendations you made is how do we get, you know, more African-based African scholars into the uh, uh, mainstream study of African economic history, because, you know, part of it is their circumstances will lead them to ask the, correct, the right questions that maybe folks are overlooking. Uh, the other argument is, of course, that for folks who are more optimistic, uh, like you seem about the prospects of African development uh, in the future, questions like Okots reflect the, 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 the consciousness, social consciousness of very many Africans. The numbers can be touted for all we want, but we don't feel that material, tangible change in our livelihoods. That my mm. country has been growing at 7% for 30 years. Uh, I probably don't have much to show for that as a citizen, who, by the way, is not doing very badly. Uh, you can now imagine uh, what the, the, the largest chunk of the people are. So if we are saying that the age of looking for an African dummy, as uh, Kolya refers to it, is gone, right? And I'm trying to tie this back to, to, to Okot's question. Why, 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 do, why do we have this constant uh, uh, mismatch? between very good performance, you, you presented that growth, poverty has fallen 20 percentage points in Africa uh, since uh, 2000, I believe. Uh, but when we see the, 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 the political situation on the continent, protests, overtaking of power, the agitation of young people, it all speaks to a discontent, which certainly tells a different narrative from what economists are telling us. We are growing, we're doing well, the future looks good. We don't feel that. So how do we reconcile the constant failure of all these things that you know have been prescribed? Uh, are we going to be in a loop of continuous thinking and imagining new things and, and them failing? Don't you think that we now need to factor in the last thing you discussed, the power factor, that this is at the World Trade Organization level, there's a power dynamic in the world that perhaps constrains what we can do in the world. Don't you have to deal with that first? Isn't that the key factor that is constraining the success of all prescriptions that people are making. 
I will leave it at that. That's a mouthful, but I try to pack a lot into that, and I'll let you deal with this. Okay, I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. I think the first thing is why I am quite optimistic about the last three years. So I was I was actually in uh, Uganda in uh, 2004, right? And I think the Uganda of today is a very different Uganda of 2004, and certainly it's a very different Uganda from of 1984. Right. Um, and, and the reason is that so many more people survive beyond the age five than was the case before. So, so even though you see a lot of protests and even though you see a lot of um, you know, uh, people that are upset perhaps by their situation, the, the brutal reality is that in 1984, it's very likely that they wouldn't even have lived beyond the age of five, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's just a larger, Africa's population compared to a century ago, is massive, right? Compared to a, a very labor scarce continent um, a century ago. So, so I think the the good news in Africa is often missed if we just look at the GDP statistics, um, because the statistic that we should be looking at is is the number of kids that survive infant, uh, you know, uh, dying be before the age of five. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the first point I want to make. Um, uh, the second point is that it's not always a linear process of economic development. So from like, you know, agriculture, and then uh, we see kind of increasing incomes and, and people becoming um, uh, uh, kind of, I guess, more kind of happier and, and, and calm. Actually, the, the fact that there is protests is also a sign that, that, that's, that there's development happening, that people can actually voice their concerns. Because in an, there's no protest when there's a, 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 des, a despot in power or autocrat in power, right? So, so just, I mean, that's a kind of a side note, but the, the fact of, you, of, of us seeing kind of a rise in people voicing their concerns, certainly in South Africa, social uh, protests, yeah, um, against social, uh, uh, you know, that's, it's terrible the fact that there are no services delivered in those areas. But there were no kind of protests like that during apartheid, and that doesn't mean that apartheid was better. It certainly means, you know, there was a crushing military state, basically crushing any protest, any kind of voicing of, of, um, of concern. So, so, yeah, just kind of the correlation between protests and development is not necessarily a, a kind of a linear one that that you that you um, that one might have in mind. So that's the second point. Um, and then there was a third point that I forget what it is. So now I- There's <laughs> a question of power, question of power. Oh yeah, yeah, so yeah, exactly, yeah. So I, there are unbalanced relations, right? All across the world, within countries, across countries. Um, I think we spend too much time worrying about those. The question we should ask about our internal policies is what can we do that allows a larger growing young African market to empower themselves. And yes, we want to export to the world. I think we should focus less on export, trying to export manufactured goods and more on services, but, but other people might have other ideas. But actually in terms of exporting services, it's, it's pretty easy to do that, right? It's not that difficult to sell someone something over the internet. Um, so there's, there's, there are actually fewer restrictions in doing that. So, so trying to think about the creative ways of, I think, managing the existing system and then realizing also that obviously a growing society gains, a growing society in terms of income gains power, right? The kind of power that China had 20, 30 years ago, the kind of power that India had 30 years ago, right? Let's not focus too much on China, was tiny compared to what the, the power that India has today. And it's because India has grown richer, not necessarily because the world has adapted some kind of different view of India. It's because India itself changed their policies from largely kind of a top-down uh, kind of command style economy with socialist policies, very restrictive policies to a freer enterprise. Even though there are many issues still in India, it's, it's a country that has now gained a lot of um, uh, income for both the poor and the rich. And so now it has a, a bigger role in the world and it can start dictating its own policies. And that's, I think, what what kind of what we should focus on in Africa at the moment, rather than always hoping that the rest of the world will change their, their attitude. 
Thank you so much, Professor Furi. The only uh, retort I'll make is much of the progress in the sectors that matter, maternal mortality, infant mortality, on, in Africa at least, has not been because of, largely not because of our growth, but because of the official development assistance, at least in the case of Uganda. I know you know about the Abuja Declaration, where countries committed themselves to dedicate 15% of their annual budgets to healthcare, and uh, only a handful are doing that. So much of the improvements in these uh, human development indicators is actually coming from uh, assistance we're getting from, from external, external actors, which is uh, quite embarrassing. But thank you so much. I'll hand it back to Bengi now. Uh, I hope we found this uh, to be a fruitful uh, interaction. Bengi, over to you. Very fruitful, very fruitful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Furi, for coming and talking to us today. Um, I will be honest, there were moments where I felt completely out of depth in this discussion as someone who studies social sciences and humanities, but um, that's not to say that it didn't let me think and question and see perspectives that I was really taking for granted in my own study um, and even in my own personal life. So thank you for shedding light on these issues. To our participants, thank you so much for the questions you all were, uh, were dropping in the chat. I, I learned so much just from um, the ways that you all were interpreting the information that was being transmitted. Um, next week is our final Tangaza session. We will be joined by Dr. Ashil Mbembe, who will respond to the question, um, how have nationalism and modernity shaped Africa's cultural uh, trajectory um, and we look forward to seeing you all for that one. Dr. Furi, thank you so much once again. It's been a pleasure having you and we look forward to continued engagement with you and your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Keep well. Thank you.